This is Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. Yesterday was President's Day, and in early February, political historians marked the 100th anniversary of the death of Woodrow Wilson. So, let's talk about Wilson. If Wilson's name brings anything to mind for most of Americans, it's probably the 14 points. It's a speech you might have had to study in high school history. In that speech, he outlined his vision for accomplishing world peace. He believed his vision would stop World War I. It didn't. Wilson's colleagues in the Allied powers rejected Wilson's idealism. But Woodrow Wilson was a man of many ideas. Some of them worked and changed the face of American government, probably for the better. But he's now largely reviled as a racist by liberals and a tyrant by conservatives. So on this 100th anniversary of his death, is it time to reassess Woodrow Wilson? If you graduated from college within the past dozen years, here's a bunch of things you do not know. And your parents and grandparents thought these things were important and they were right. David Frum of The Atlantic joins us in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Hear Me Out. I'm Celeste Headley. American citizenship is one of the very basic requirements you must meet in order to become president. The earliest presidents, like Washington, became citizens when the Constitution was ratified. A small handful since then have been born to mixed citizenship parents. But two presidents were at one time citizens of the Confederate States of America. The first was John Tyler, who joined the Confederacy after he served as president. And the second was Woodrow Wilson, son of the South from toddlerhood until he went to Princeton in 1874. His father, Joseph Wilson, was a Presbyterian preacher in Georgia, and Wilson was the last president born into a slave-owning family. The Civil War ended when Wilson was 11 years old, and he became president when he was 57. As a politician, his legacy has become complicated. On the one hand, he was virulently racist, very much a product of the Confederate South, but he did have a productive presidency. He created stuff like the Federal Reserve and the FTC. There's a piece in this month's issue of The Atlantic that argues we have written off or even canceled Wilson, and it's time to take another look at this man, lest we forget what a great president really looks like. Our guest is David Frum, a commentator and staff writer at The Atlantic. Welcome. Thank you so much. So, let me I'm gonna, let me have you give us the the sort of elevator pitch of your your thesis here. The reason why you want us to reconsider Wilson, acknowledging that he was horribly racist, <laughs> is what? Why do we study the lives of human beings at all? Um, we could tell history as laws passed, reforms initiated, measures adopted. Um, we could leave the personalities out, and a lot of historians do, and say that his personalities are distracting. We study personalities and the personalities of leading people because we think there are lessons there. Um, and every human being is fault flawed, um, those of yesterday and those of today. Um, many of the attitudes that prevail today will seem absurd or malicious or dangerous a hundred years hence. We study people in order to teach. So what can we learn from the life of Woodrow Wilson. Well, you and I are speaking on a day when the Congress of the United States looks like it is about to formally cut off the already suspended aid to a democracy, a fellow democracy, Ukraine, as it's invaded by Russia. Um, and many Americans say, well, what has any of this to do with us? Who cares what happens to other countries far away? Um, how uh, we, we're, we're safe here at home. We don't need to worry about the security of others. The idea that the United States would find its security through cooperation with like-minded nations was an idea that was brought to American life by Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was not the first president to lead a strong foreign policy. It's um, President McKinley had fought the Spanish-American War. President Roosevelt was, of course, Teddy Roosevelt, very assertive. But Wilson was the first to say that the United States could find more security by cooperating with others. That's an idea that is very much in danger now. And in the generations that remembered World War II, Wilson's life was taught as a, a life of flawed, but a bold and heroic endeavor um, in order to try to bring America into the world. He failed to a great extent in, um, in the la last years of his presidency. He was struck down by a stroke um, in October 1919 and left almost paralyzed. The people who wrote about him, the most famous book about him was written by another president, Herbert Hoover. It's called The Ordeal of Woodrow Wilson, and it told the story of this kind of martyrdom and a lesson for the future 
Uh, Americans of 1947 do not repeat the mistakes of the Americans of 1919, step into the world and uphold the security of the world. Wilson gave his life for that ideal. You should honor it. Um, we're losing sight of that now. And I think that stand uh, is something that I think is very important to renew. Let me jump in here real quick, David, because, you know, for a long time, um, probably for most of the time since Woods Wilson's death, he was seen as um, a, a, a heroic character. Yeah. I mean, not maybe not martyr. heroic, but admirable. More he was seen as a, a, as a reformer. Yeah. He was seen as a, an internationalist. Yeah. He has a we can't even number the, the, the institutions that bear his name. Um, there has only been a real reconsider of re reconsideration of Wilson in recent years, right? Like you're asking us to reconsider the reconsideration, it sounds like, but it's only been relatively recently that um, people have started to, uh, you know, really dig into the the choices he made the, the his repressive tactics during World War One. Why do we need to reconsider again? Because although um, this reconsideration, as you call it, is comparatively recent, it's about now about a decade long. It has been very harsh, very extreme. Um, it is not just that people are publishing books saying here are aspects of Wilson's life that um, got less attention at one point, ne never zero, but less. Is that he, um, th there used to be, as you say, many things named after him. His name is coming down from high schools across the country. I keep lo have lost track of how many high schools have taken his name off. The um, Princeton University, which is a university he raised from being a kind of genteel finishing school to um, a great educational institution. It had two major things named for him. Both are gone. The, uh, here in Washington, there's a thing called the, the Wood Woodrow Wilson Center. It's chartered by Act of Congress, so they can't just drop the name because they'd have to rewrite the charter. But they've effectively removed the name from um, all of the activities of the Woodrow Wilson Center, and they called the Wilson. They dropped the. They, they certainly have dropped the Woodrow. Um, and look, uh, the question here now: um, when when you talk to people who have been re recently college educated in the United States, there is one thing about Wilson they know, and only one thing. And th they know that one thing, by the way, much more than it was true. They will say things like. Um, they, they say that Woodrow Wilson did things that happened while he was president. Um, Wilson was in many ways quite a, would often be quite a passive president. And so um, it wasn't Wilson who resegregated this, the civil, who segregated the civil service. It was done during the Wilson administration and he allowed it to happen and didn't intervene, but he was not the driver. So there's this one thing that people know. And they think, because I know that one thing or think I know this one thing, therefore I don't need to know anything else. Um, and so I think the, the reason I wrote this piece in, in the particular way I did was to say, I am going to reckon with the full act record. I mean, the, as you will see, the piece talks about um, uh, the, Wilson's racist attitudes. It talks about the segregation, that the more formal segregation, because it had existed before, but the more formal segregation of the, of the civil service. It talks about the spasm of repression that uh, swept across the country in the last year and after the First World War. Wilson was an invalid during part of that period, but it was on his watch. He was responsible. He didn't resign. So you know all those things. But if you graduated from college within the past dozen years, here's a bunch of things you do not know. And your parents and grandparents thought these things were important and they were right. You know, it's it's difficult for me. You know, I come from a, a, a black and Jewish family. And for me to, to reconsider and, and start to focus in on the things that that Wilson did well reminds me too much of the effort to focus on say the the good things that that Robert E. Lee did or or the good things that any other um, racist person did. I mean, we're talking about a man, Wilson, who resegregated the federal government, whose moral diplomacy policy is still impacting Central America in a negative way, a, a man who refused to sign the Treaty of Versailles. I mean, it, why? It, there are so many people whose whose record is less complicated. Well, well I mean, Wilson didn't refuse to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Um, the, the, the United States Senate, he promoted the Treaty of Versailles, which was a flaw. Um, he did some bad jobs negotiating the treaty. It wasn't the right. treaty that he should have brought home. And then the United I should have said he was not able to get yeah. the support he needed. Yet. Yeah, and the United States Senate failed to ratify it. And again, I, there's a lot to criticize about Wilson's peacemaking. Um, Wilson was, he was a man of words. He, he thought like a lawyer, so he never understood 
the economic and financial aspects of making the peace, there's a lot to criticize. Um, but look, when you say you have this experience and it leads you, the whole point to studying history is to be brought out of your own experience. Is the great Roman philosopher and political theorist Cicero said, to be ignorant of the world before you were born is to be forever a child. A child judges by himself or herself. They, um, uh, as we achieve the more tragic status of emerging into the world, we, we learn things were different. Other people had different views. And we also, it's very salutary to say, here are great people, and they saw the world very differently from us. Maybe we have something to learn from them. Maybe we are less all sufficient. Maybe we are less uh, should be less certain about ourselves, um, and maybe we should have our perspectives widened by confronting very different times and places. But in the case of and in the case of Woodrow Wilson, it's not a story of of, of unbridled success, and it's not a story, by the way, of a, a completely admirable human being. I talk a lot, I and mean, I have never. I mean, I'm pretty interested in the period and the personalities. I've never found him an attractive personality compared to some others. But that doesn't make his achievements less, and that doesn't mean that we um, that we should study him with dishonor, because we we should honor what uh, he accomplished, because those accomplishments are needed now, especially when we are turned. His great achievements, in my opinion, were the United States turned in 1861 to keeping out foreign goods um, under the Republican domination of the. Um, from the Civil War, that lasted from the Civil War through the Great Depression, the United States was mostly a protectionist country. Um, there's an interval under the Democrats from 1913 to 1921 when the United States traded in freedom. And that was good not just for American consumers who got cheaper goods, but it also offered the only hope of peace after the First World War. After the First World War, which left Europe a ruin, left the countries in debt, they needed to export to the United States to buy food, to finance reconstruction. When this unpopularity that Wilson fell into at the end led in 1920 to a giant Republican landslide that elected Warren G. Harding and a massive majority in House and Senate for the Republicans, they reimposed the tariffs that had been there before 1913. And they raised them to some of the highest levels ever seen. And that made it impossible for Europe to export to the United States and to earn its living again. And that's what set us on the path to the Great Depression and ultimately the Second World War. Those were lessons that people in the 1940s, as they planned a new world after the Second World War, thought Americans needed to learn, and there are lessons that we need more than ever now and are discarding. So that's it's not just the, the coincidence that Wilson died 100 years ago in, 19, in, in February of 1923 that prompted the article, but also the geopolitical circumstances of today, where collective security, free ta trade, America as part of the world, that is a lesson that needs to be rediscovered. Okay, we have to take a break, but we will come back because I, I really think this issue of of studying and honoring historical figures who are possibly problematic is so important um, at this time when we as a nation are kind of grappling with a with a problematic history. So we'll we'll come back in just a moment with David Frum. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. I'm Celeste Headley. Stay with us. The history of HIV and AIDS is the history of people who were told to stay out of sight and who refused to do so. Gay men, but also injection drug users, women and, yes, children who contracted the virus. Join host Kai Wright for Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows, a new series that seeks to answer the question of how much pain could have been avoided had we paid attention sooner. From the History Channel and WNYC Studios, Blind Spot, The Plague in the Shadows. Listen wherever you get podcasts. And we're back. I'm Celeste Headley, and this is Hear Me Out. My guest today is David Frum, who has written a piece in The Atlantic arguing that we have, as a nation, kind of discarded Wilson, Woodrow Wilson's legacy too quickly. Um, but let me do just a little bit more pushback, because there is a philosophical question here of how you can study a, a person from history without honoring them. And my argument would be that I don't feel any need to honor Woodrow Wilson. But let me go to a couple things that um, are sort of on your, your side of what makes him great. Um, first of all, he, he was the one that nationalized railroads um, and turned them over to then return them to private ownership. And I would say today we are seeing the effects of that as a bad decision. 
the privatization of the, the railroads has turned out, a hundred years later, to be really um, problematic. The 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 private uh, privately owned railroads have a horrible safety record. They're slowing down even the Amtrak's um, times because they their their trains break down on the tracks. I mean, that's one thing that people used to say was a was a good decision he made. I would say that wasn't a good decision. Well, that does seem as the they would say in the railway industry, kind of a spur. Um, uh, like Wilson's railway management, I, I think he made good calls on both uh, decisions, but it does seem like he, he the reason he nationalized the railways in the first place was because, um, of course, America needed to supply its allies in the war. It needed to supply its own troops. There were strikes, but the railways were also organized in very inefficient ways. Um, they, they, were, they were not organized into a true national system in 1916. Um, so when they nationalized the railways, that allowed them to standardize various practices. It allowed them to make sure that all railway employees had the same wages and the same safety conditions. And you, you created a much more streamlined system and was returned to private ownership in the 1920s. And look, American railway, freight railway is the envy of the world. We move more goods, more cheaply with less uh, carbon emission than anybody else. Europeans move people by trains and goods by truck. We move people by car and goods by train. Um, that's a best kind of a byway. But I want to say, if the principle is that, I don't know what, what exactly you mean by problematic, but if people, have, if you say people have made bad, if you make an important bad decision, that means uh, that the other things about your life um, that were great, we can disregard. That's going to apply to a lot of people. One of Wilson's early supporters and then early critics was the great historian and writer W.E.B. Du Bois. Yes. Um, who put his faith in Wilson. Um in 19, they, 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 like most uh, black Americans, he was a Republican early. He was very disenchanted by certain actions of the Teddy Roosevelt and then William Howard. T yeah, I think you could say that Woodrow Wilson helped turn black Americans away from the Republican Party. I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about Wilson, not a single act or not a single word of yours since election has given anyone reason to infer you have the slightest interest in the colored people or desire to alleviate their intolerable position. I mean, he may be responsible for, okay, for so turning w black voters to I think W.E.B. Du Bois, Democrats. he was a great writer, a great thinker. In 1961... W.E.B. Du Bois joined the American Communist Party. Um, he, he became an actual card holding con after all the details of Stalin's camps were known. Um, after all the after the persecution of all the writers was was known. Um, after the anti-Semitic uh, doctor's plot was known. What do we make of the fact that W.E.B. Du Bois joined the Communist Party? That is a terrible decision. Making yourself a servitor of global dictatorship like that does that eliminate? The power of what W. B. Du Bois wrote in 1913 about Woodrow Wilson, I would say no. I would say you can still admire him, even, even though correctly hor horrified by his decision to become a communist. And he'd been sympathetic to the party before, but he actually became formally a member at 61. I would say, you know, but still a great man. Um, it, there are people whose j decisions, I think, you know, you can you can step over. There, there are always lines, and that's one of the reasons we do we, we do close study of historical persons, you know, uh, harder case, Charles Lindbergh, great av aviator, um, but played a, te a terrible role in 1940, 41, tried to keep the United States out of the second world war, lent very anti-Semitic, very, um, I would, strongly anti-Semitic, very, very, very is a strong word, uh, but certainly said and communicated anti-Semitic thoughts. Um, and the, but the reason we study the particularities is to deal with the particularities. And I, one of the reasons I think, and I think we're having this fascinating conversation now, um, as I said, we are very ready um, to, uh, in a, to, on the basis of not enough information about people, to say, okay, we're putting you in this box. And then other people who did other things, because we are even less informed about them, we're not putting them in the box. And the question we, we ask is, and um, we got a series of a sh very short list of modern checkmark questions. And how did you do on our very short list of modern checkmark questions? Um, where uh, and then and then that's all we need to know. And then we cut ourselves off from stories that are resources for the present. As I said, you can tell history entirely in impersonal terms, and there's something to be said for that. But if you're going to make people feel their responsibility, their political choices, and enter into the debates and spirits of the past. You're going to need personalities to teach them how to think about it. So, I mean, I'm going to set W.E.B. Dewey's aside 
um, that we, you and I could have a, a probably have a really good discussion about why I think B, Du Bois joining the Communist Party is very different th than Wilson's record. But that is a different conversation. There is a degree, though, um, in p reconsidering people's legacies, um, in trying to decide whether someone is deserving of honor, um, we can't pretend like all mistakes are equal. No, I, we can't I, pretend. You know, we can't pretend like I, I wouldn't argue. Uh, joining, yeah, but I would say you can't. You can't even imply that joining a communist party, whatever we may think of that, it's pretty um, But taking no actions that hurt someone um, directly is very, very different than Woodrow Wilson, who often and frequently took actions and made decisions on his own that hurt a lot of people. Well, um, and most of them were people of color, uh, f people, immigrants from other nations. Those were decisions he made. And I, I, I you know, it's difficult. That, that this is where we bump into what people think they know versus what they really do know. So uh, Wilson, okay. w Wilson twice vetoed measures to impose literacy tests on foreign immigrants. Um, and he, he, in his messages, veto, he said that literacy is, um, uh, is a function of education. Education is a fun function of opportunity. Uh, so when someone is coming to the United States to seek opportunity, you do not deny them because they have been denied the opportunity um, to have to obtain literacy before. So the, I, I think it, is, it would be startling to people that, to know that Wilson, well, the United States was moving toward immigration restriction um, because of the radicalism of the period. There had been a lot of there were a lot of radical incidents in 1919, 20, um, committed by often foreign-born persons. The Wall Street bombing of 1920, the worst domestic terrorist incident until 9/11. So there was a lot of there's a lot of panic and fear in the air about um, what immigrants are doing to domestic security, and a lot of that and that that led to the restrictions of the early 1920s. But Wilson was on the other side of that debate. Wilson was also um, a, an opponent of uh, Asian exclusion. Um, so one of the things that uh, is complicated about Wilson is he was uh, he was, he had strong anti-black prejudices, but he was not yeah. at all points racist. And meanwhile, there's this paradox. We talk about this in the piece. <laughs> Did you say he was not at all points racist? All points, you mean he wasn't a, he wasn't racist against all races? He was not. So one of the pieces that <laughs> is that with, what that means? Because no, that seems like really. Cutting the hair fine. No, David. well, then let me ask you. So his great opponent was a man named Henry Cabot Lodge, who was leader of the Senate. Yes. Lodge was the opposite. Lodge was not an anti-black racist. Uh, in fact, R Lodge wrote um, in, a, in the 1890s the most comprehensive bill defending black voting rights that the United States would see between the 15th Amendment and the Civil Rights Era, the Lodge Bill of 1890 or 91, I now forget. So that it was a um, and had it been passed, the history of the United States would have been a lot happier. So Brought Lodge was a passionate advocate of black voting rights. He was also a, he was a virulent anti-Semite, and he was ferociously anti-Catholic, and he defended the lynching of Catholic immigrants to Louisiana. So there's someone who had who was a, an ally of black America and an anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish bigot. That kind of thing used to happen a lot in the United States. And so um, when we enter the past, one of the reasons that makes the past interesting is you enter a different world where politics is organized in different ways. And understanding that world and how, how it was possible that the politics of 1900 could be organized so differently, not the reverse, but just completely a different map, that will make you a better citizen of the world of 2020 because you'll understand things have been different in the past. They might be different in the future. And I understand my country in a way that if I just say, here are the negatives and this is it, and this is all I need to know, um, you will not be so informed as citizen. So I read the book that you probably read as well, American Midnight, um, about the Wilson years. And I, I, I went back to it and I pulled out a quote from that book. Um, and, and I want to read it to you. By some measures, and certainly in many quarters of the American left, the years 1917 to 21 have a special place in infamy. The United States during that time saw a swell of patriotic frenzy and political repression rarely rivaled in its history. President Woodrow Wilson's terror campaign against American rattles, dissidents, immigrants, and workers makes the McCarthyism of the 1950s look almost subtle by comparison. And look, you know, 
every human being on the planet has unconscious bias, all of us. We judge people based on all kinds of things unfairly and, and, and um, unconscious assumptions we make about other people. Uh, someone may not be anti-black racist, but they may discriminate against those who are overweight. Someone may not be um, anti-Semitic, but they may discriminate on, against people who are not tall. I mean, we've rarely had presidents who are less than six feet tall. So like to talk about the different biases some people had for me is not the point. We're talking about a president who was a vocal, vocal, wait, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Who again resegregated the federal government? My one of my ancestors was working for the post Royal Postal Service at that time, and um, he lost a great deal of that. That contributed to the massive income gap between black and white workers. It, it eroded a lot of the gains that were made during Reconstruction. Um, he also, uh, although he didn't, he criticized the means that they were using. He was a vocal defender of the KKK. Um, he, no. he, you know, I mean, we're talking about a guy who you cannot get, you cannot say he was anything, but he was a racist. I mean, I we don't can say quibble that. about- But, but, but Celeste, they're, they're, you're saying a lot of, going very fast, a lot of things, and they're, they're not right. They're not right. Wilson was a racist, he was a segregationist, and he did support the overthrow of black voting rights in the um, Reconstruction South. And, but- Yes. History of the, but he, he was not a defender of the KKK he, because Wilson was also a legalist. And he, you know one, one of the things I came across, in, and I want to talk about Hotschild too in a minute, but one of the things I came across um, in my research for the, um, this article was a footnote that Neil Gorsuch, the Justice of the Supreme Court, appended to, his, yes. uh, 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 to a case in which he was adjudicating whether the EPA can regulate car climate changing gases. And the first footnote is this very strenuous attack on the character of, of Woodrow Wilson. And you think, what is this doing there? And obviously, well, Wilson was a defender of, admin, of business regulation, and he, Gorsuch is trying to defame business regulation by association. But when you read the footnote, it's full of quotations from Wilson's writings. He, uh, but was, and they come mostly from two sources, an essay he wrote in 1887 and a history book he published in 1900. Both of them- That would be the history of American people. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're going to quote are, from that a little Both of these are posted online. Both of them are searchable. And I know the essay on administration, which is short, is not searchable, but the history of the American people is searchable. And if you search it, what you discover is that Gorsuch, or his clerk more likely, um, either was plucking things without regard to context, often to make them mean exactly the opposite of what Wilson meant, or more probably that he was relying on some secondary source. We have to take a break, but I, I cannot disagree with you more. And I, and I want to quote directly from Wilson to come back to this point, because it's kind of the essential point. For me, this is one of the essential points. But we do have to take a break. Uh, this is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. We will continue talking about Woodrow Wilson's legacy in just a moment with David Frum. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Celeste Headley. This is Hear Me Out, a podcast from Slate. And today we're talking about Woodrow Wilson and how to remember him. And just before the break, our guest, David Frum, you were talking about how, and you're correct, Woodrow Wilson um, felt that there was a quote from Wilson that was used as a title card in the movie The Birth of a Nation. That's a movie that he screened at the White House. And he felt it taken out of context. And And like I said... It is true that Wilson strongly criticized the means used by the KKK. But let's go back to that book you mentioned, the Hi A History of American People, and read some of the other quotes he wrote about the lost cause myth. Things like, the white men of the South were aroused by the mere instinct of self-preservation to rid themselves by fair means or foul of the intolerable burden of governments sustained by the votes of ignorant Negroes and conducted in the interest of adventurers. He also said, adventurers swarmed out of the North as much the enemies of one race as of the other to cousin guile and use the Negroes in the villages the Negroes were the office holders, men who knew none of the uses of authorities except its insolences. And he also said that the, the, the policy of the congressional leaders wrought a veritable overthrow of civilization in the South in their determination to put the white South under the heel of the black South. I, this is not a guy who was no. Um, no, criticizing no. the principles and beliefs of the KKK. No, he he just wanted them to follow the law. He criticized violence. So Wilson was, as I say in the piece very explicitly and repeatedly, Wilson was an advocate of um, white supremacy and white rule of the South. Um, and once you've said that, you've said a lot. 
and you would think you've said enough. Um, but that's apparently not enough that we have to add the KKK measure, which again, that book, he, when he calls it fair means and foul, what he meant was he opposed violence, he opposed lawlessness, he thought these things should be done um, in a different way. Now, he, he um, that that was white supremacy. He was a believer in that. And he um, and there are many other instances. I mean, when he um, was taking the United States into uh, the First World War, one of the things he worried about was that the, the war in Europe would empower uh, non-white races uh, to assert. He said that in, in his cabinet meeting. I didn't quote that in the piece. There wasn't room for everything. But that that was part of the way he thought. That's part of the, rec of the record of, of who he was. And that is that is the dishonor along with the the honor. But it it is never quite enough. We talked about this book by Hochschild, and I, I did read that book very carefully because one of the things I was I read it for was of the things that Hochschild is talking about, which of them were executive presidential actions? And and one of the things you can that the book is is quite it, it it steps from one foot to the other quite a lot. It'll tell some horrible story about um, some terrible abuse that happened. Um, in some place against uh, typically a labor organizer. Um, and and then we pivot to what, but it's never quite clear how these parts connect. One of the reasons Wilson opposed entry into the world First World War as long as he did, um, and from the point of view of some of his opponents too long, was he often said, if we go to war, there's going to be a mood of hysteria unleashed in this country. Wilson, um, one of the things we choose to forget is how much mob violence was associated with all the wars before the First World War. The American Revolution um, was a war in which all the things that you write about in America, that are written about in American Midnight, the attacks of neighbor upon neighbor, murder, lynching, that all happened in 1776, 1777, 1778. We choose not to remember it, but it did. Um, it happened in both North and South against other people. The guerrilla wars in, in Missouri and North Carolina um, and and these, these were wars of terrorism that Americans fought against each other. Again, we choose not to remember that. Um, so, but Wilson knew that history of what war has, to, until the American state got a lot stronger, what wars unleashed in American society. And that's one of the reasons he dreaded the First World War. Um, uh, it, it did unleash terrible repression. And then when Wilson was incapacitated in October 1919, and the prize of the next presidency opened, other ambitious players began at both who were seeking the presidency began to ride it. And then you get this story of Mitchell Palmer, who was Wilson's attorney general, who was a Quaker, a pacifist, had opposed entry into the First World War for pacifist reasons. His house was bombed, uh, his children were put at risk, and he had this kind of snap where he became then a very repressive figure and was let, led a lot of these actions with his associate, J. Edgar Hoover, at a time when Wilson was non-functional. And he should have resigned, by the way. That's another negative mark against him, that he, sh he should have quit when he had his stroke, and he didn't. And he, um, he, his vanity and his ego and his, his craving for power, those are all parts of the legacy. Um, but I, I want people to, to judge in an informed way. And I think there's a lot of, there's this kind of bandwagon effect where because Wilson is one of the um, safe free fire zones in American history, that, that you can write a book like American Midnight and not count on a lot of hard questions not being asked by the people who read and review it. So not everyone who criticizes Woodrow Wilson is um, liberal no. or an anti-racist. Um, there was not too long ago um, a, a long screed from Glenn Beck, no. the right-wing radio host against Woodrow Wilson, but also some conservative scholars um, have have pointed to that 2008 book liberal fascism uh i remember glenn beck saying that you know fdr was considered the worst president by a lot of republicans but he felt that we should consider wilson instead um that he well rudra wilson was in fact uh too progressive for conservatives to embrace what do you make of that criticism well, i i have in fact much more of my piece has replied to his critics on the right than his critics on the left. Because, well, I think the criticism on the left is is overstated and um, decontextualized. The basic critique is true. Um, it is true that Wilson was an anti-black bigot um, and an advocate of white supremacy and a, a supporter of the overthrow of Reconstruction in the South. That's all true. Um, you can overstate it. You can exaggerate it. You can omit, omit nuance and um, uh, you can view it with, um, without 
perspective how this at the time, but the basic core of it is true. Um, the, the right of center critique is an attempt to condemn everything that has happened in the United States in the 20th century, the rise of the new role of the federal government in the economy, the rise of central banking, um, debates that were once very important over the gold standard versus uh, other forms of, of money, um, that uh, debates over free trade and tariffs, that these are were once really important debates because the consequences of the wrong answer were so serious. We've had the right answer mostly in place for a while, so we forget it. And above all, it was a way Glenn Beck intuited that even after 2010, it was still not okay uh, to go in, criticize Franklin Delano Roosevelt's entry into the Second World War, even though, as we are seeing in the Trump era, there are a lot of people who have that in mind. But the First World War is so obscure and so complicated and so tragic that you could take the arguments that would that you could now repurpose against World War II, and as we see now repurpose to abandon Ukraine, and say, let's all direct them at those months in 1916, 1917. Um, and, the, and Gorsuch's footnote say, since Wilson wrote these things, and I'm taking in many cases very much out of context, therefore the EPA cannot regulate greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, I, I have these criticisms very much in mind, and in some ways they are more dangerously relevant to the politics of today. Um, I, I want the, I am above all concerned to defend Wilson as an advocate of collective security, of integrating the U.S. in the world economy, and the choices that his party, not he himself, because he didn't care enough, his party would have made in 1920 um, to trade freely, um, to have a more expansive monetary, but that was the that is the difference in putting us on the path to the Depression and the Second World War, and putting us on the path to a different future. When the opposite decisions were made after the Second World War, we built a better world. So we we only have a few minutes left, and um, rather than go into other criticisms historians have made of Woodrow Wilson, I want to get back to that question of um, the value in. The value in in discussing legacies, um, as opposed to, to to studying history through what decisions were made, the the outcome. Um, in other words, we could talk about Wilson not by talking about him as a man, but talking about how he conducted World War One, how he um, uh, manipulated neutrality policies, and that may have um, brought on the war faster, but. Instead, I wanted to return to this issue of whether we need to be talking about Woodrow Wilson as a man, period. Um, if, if we think that, if we know that every human being is problematic, um, perhaps there should be no statues of any person. Perhaps it should always be a discussion of their decisions and the policies and their, the context. Yes. And if we were all very, very serious about studying history, there would be a lot of merit to that. Many people have seen the musical Hamilton. Um, unt until this point, before Hamilton, uh, there, there's a small band of people who are obsessively interested in American banking and tariff policy like me, who had strong opinions about Hamilton one way or the other. But most people thought he was a faraway figure, um, and they, they might have ever, you know, he, he, was not he was not a Democrat or Democratic at all, um, but he did seem to have something to do with the money and the money's good. So and the idea of him as a hungering, needy, striving person, um, that people came out of that with an impression, my God, the politics of the 1790s are not made out of marble. They are not uh, made out of statues. These were people. Um, and their greatness is not because they were so different from us, but because they confronted such, they were so similar and they confronted such huge and novel problems. And uh, a lot of people who never thought about how do you do a banking system? Should the United States have a central bank? That's a pretty ab abstract question. What you know? What is uh, what is right? Gold, silver, or paper money? Um, ha that musical made them live in a way that people who don't spend all their time thinking about history could understand and could feel. And and it also made you understand why did Aaron Burr hate him so much that he would want to murder him. It, by the way, this is going to enter into our current politics was because Burr, who was serving as vice president at the time, was indicted both in New York and New Jersey showing that in the founding generation, a vice president who broke the law of a state could be prosecuted by that state. That's going to be a very relevant precedent. So we, we don't just see these people as monuments. We don't see them as made out of marble and 20 feet high. We see them as people. And that's the way most of us learn. 
and we put ourselves in their shoes and confront their problems. And we also understand that things that happened a certain way didn't have to happen that way. It could have happened other ways, sometimes better, but more often worse. And we develop our human sympathy. Um, and that, you know, I think one of the things that we've been seeing is the tenor of our times is not a lot of human sympathy. People are problematic, therefore they're bad, therefore they're dead. And we, we uh, and, you know, and whatever your quadrant of American culture is, that's how you tend to see it. And I think other generations have valued human sympathy more than ours does. It's a quality I value a lot. Um, just to enter into the problems and just understand things Things were so hard. There's a passage in um, the Aeneid where uh, they describe some terrible thing that the hero Aeneas has to do and the poet comments, so hard and heavy a task was it to found the city of Rome. Well, it was a hard and heavy task to found the United States too. And if we enjoy it's the goodness and greatness of the country, and I hope we do, um, we owe a backward glance of thanks to the people who gave us what we have. This conversation has given me a lot to think about, and I know I will be thinking about it in the weeks ahead, frankly, uh, because it's an issue for our times. How do we remember people in history, all of whom made bad decisions and mistakes and were problematic to some degree or another, some more problematic than others? We have to be fair. But we do want to hear from you. I would love to hear from all of you about how you grapple with this issue of people's legacies. Our email address is hearmeout at slate.com. A lot of you are using that email address and we love it. Whatever your opinion, whether you think that our guest got it right or got it wrong, we do want to hear from you. Again, it's hearmeout at slate.com. Hear Me Out is a podcast from Slate. The show is produced by the not problematic Maura Curry. Ben Richmond is the senior director of podcast operations whose legacy is clean. And Alicia Montgomery is the very honorable VP of Slate Audio. I'm your host, Celeste Headley. Until next time, speak your mind, but keep it open. Hold up. 